Gut, ähm, funktioniert das? Können wir meine Folien sehen? Ja, perfekt. Okay, good. Um, then sorry, I haven't presented in Germany for a long time, in German for a long time, so I'll present in English. All right, so um, what, am I, what am I going to speak about today? So mainly I want to speak about the past, so what are the experiences I could gain, but also I want to speak about the future, so what I see as the next steps in augmented reality research. So now, as I've done augmented reality for 20 years, so first I want to show you the, my favorite system that I was involved in, and that was in 2011, our best demo award at ISMA. And you can see roughly what this is. So this here you can see a user of our system with a head-mounted display, and they can look at their hands, and then we can set their hands on fire. And let me show you how this looks like. So you can see this is very high quality fire. So there is a um, volumetric um, fluid simulation running behind the scenes, uh, real time 3D hand reconstruction. And in 2011, these were quite some major feats. And now what is very interesting is because we showed this uh, over several days at the ISMA conference in Basel. And then a number of users reported that they felt their hands getting hot which was very unexpected for us. With hindsight, it's quite logical, but for us, it was a huge surprise. And then a little later, we did some experiment, which was more controlled to really verify this, that there is, some, there is something there. So there is something that makes people feel heat when they see this realistic fire. And this we published in 2013 at the IEEE VR conference. Now, so this was a little about the past. So then also in my talk, there's some, um, yeah, speculations about the future. And for that, I want to set a little the context because if you look at the investments that are now um, happening in the AR, VR space, these are enormous. And I mean, these are just now here, uh, some selection of American companies, but of course other countries also invest a lot. And also there's a lot of government investment. Um, so, for example, here, so there was last year, right, so Microsoft got the $480 million contract to um, yeah, build HoloLenses for soldiers. And that then also includes a, a FLIR camera, so like a thermal camera, which is then gives you a superhuman vision. Um, now, but let's say these companies, yeah, like uh, Facebook and Google and so on, so why do they invest so much money into AR? And I think the answer is in this book. This is a very, I think, not so well-known book, but it's fantastic because it's describing this vision that, um, I mean, currently we have so many displays. So if you look here, this is like a typical office. So there are some screens on the wall and on the desktop, and then maybe you have your smartphone and your tablet computer and your smartwatch, and you have all of these screens. But now if you have something that near your eyeball can produce holograms, then well, you don't need only this display, no more. And so I think the motivation for companies like Google and Facebook is that, well, now everybody's addicted to their mobile phones and looks, I don't know, 20 hours a day at their mobile phone. So what would be the next device to replace all that? So I believe this is really the motivation behind these big investments. And now on the technical side, so. Of course, there's a lot of research going on, but I feel that, for example, this work, so this is going in the right direction because the goal is, um, is about spawning a light field directly on the retina. So in order to do that, you need to very precisely, of course, track the eyeball and the curvature of the eyeball and things like that. And if you know all that, then you can generate a localized light field directly on the pupil. And there are some um, prototype devices that do that. And also Henry Fuchs, I think, is doing a lot of interesting research in this space. All right, so these were now like um, two teasers, like about my past work and how I see the future. So now I want to have now um, speak about much, uh, first I want to start by speaking about my past and more precisely about this whole stream of research related to augmented reality X-ray. Um, because this, we started in 2009, and um, I'm still doing research related to that. So let's make a quick uh, fast forward through what we did there. So 
Um, you see, this is an outdoor user and the outdoor user is looking at a wall and let's imagine now we have, we know what's behind this wall. We have a 3D model or some image based modeling, but we know what's behind the wall. Then we can synthesize um, such like Superman views as so we can look through the wall and see what's behind. So let me show you a movie of how this looks like. And well, and the main trick here is that um, we do an edge detection on the foreground layer and then we highlight the edges and this helps um, the human visual system to understand that what is in front, what is in the back. Because otherwise, if you just blend the two layers together in a, um, like naively, then yeah, you, it will be very, very difficult to interpret. But just having these um, small, yeah, having these uh, edges highlighted is a small cue, but it's uh, very effective. Um, and this research now, um, after that, um, I think many companies got interested in that. So I got uh, money for systems like that from Nokia and from Samsung and from Google. Um, because I think for them, it's very obvious. I mean, they have all this data that you need for such systems. And now it's a matter of porting that to the phone. Um, so the most recent company funding I got was 2014. So I got the Google Faculty Award to um, bring these X-ray systems to Google Glass. And of course, now this was a real nightmare project because, well, I mean, there are many good things about Google Glass to say. Um, I think what is good to say, what is very good is the industrial design. I mean, look at it. Yeah? You have all these celebrities and they put Google Glass on their face. I don't think any of these celebrities would, for example, put a HoloLens on their head or any other um, AR or VR device. But Google Glass, um, very nice industrial design. So yeah, that's very tolerable. So you can wear that all day. So and I've done it. I've worn, worn it for six months um, from morning till night. But then also there are some problems with it. So I mean, one obvious blunder is that it's monocular. It just shows you information for one eye. And I mean, obviously what this will do is it will hurt your other eye. So the eye that doesn't see that. So it's called binocular rivalry. And that is, yeah, in uh, the neuroscience of vision, a well-known problem. And that also actually happened to me. So after a few months, I got um, started to feel pain in the eye, which didn't get stimulus from Google Glass. And yeah, so that's a well-known problem. And yeah, so here they blundered massively. And of course, the whole social aspect, yeah, that they roll this out in San Francisco, where you have like social unrest between the rich tech people and the kind of regular people who can't afford uh, accommodation anymore. Yeah, many blunders. Um, but the industrial design, very good. And well, also another blunder they did is that, well, they, the concept for them was, it's like a smartwatch worn in your face. So the things they intended that uh, Google Glass can do is like a smartwatch. It shows you notifications, it uh, does very primitive things. But now the question is, yeah, well, why don't you just wear a smartwatch? Why do you want to run around like this, that you have this strange thing on your face? So there should be some added value and that added value clearly could have been AR. But the way they designed Google Glass, a very weak processor, weak graphics card, overheating easily, weak battery. So yeah, it wasn't made for AR. So this was kind of that smart project to get something running on that. And um, so this was, um, I mean, Google Faculty Award is honestly speaking, not a lot of money and it's mainly about the fame. Um, so, and it's just a one year project. So, um, and what we did there is, so this is like a collaborative scenario. So basically you have, um, imagine a disaster situation. So maybe some building collapsed and you don't have any models and any information. And here we simulate um, that we have two collaborative users. So there's one which is um, now behind the wall and he's doing a live 3D reconstruction because as immediately if you have a depth camera, well, then it's quite easy to make a volumetric real-time reconstruction of the environment. So this is what we show here. And then on that real-time reconstruction, we project the video image. So um, that gives more cues like what the person is doing and what the person is seeing. And after that, um, so yeah, we're still researching about that. So for example, I have um, uh, back problems and then my doctor is giving me these kind of exercises that I should do. And now I'm wondering, yeah, I mean, is this really the best way to illustrate these kind of uh, motions and what would be uh, the right way to do this exercise? What's the wrong way? So th this is not really well explained here. 
So then um, I started collaborating with my old lab again in TU Munich and with Professor Nawab, and they have many interesting X-ray systems also, and uh, all of them medical. And uh, what you see here, so now here you can see, okay, this is like a prototype, so things are not well aligned, but basically you see the uh, muscles and the bones and the upper arm, and then you see how, as you move your arm, how they get activated, right? So I think this is a very um, powerful way to um, teach people about movements, right? So they see kind of the cause and the effect in, inside their own body. Yes, and basically we used the system and also we had some uh, ISMA paper about that where we um, evaluated that with uh, medical doctors in TU Munich and also Johns Hopkins University, like how effective that is for teaching anatomy to medical students. And now the most recent thing we are doing, um, this is a collaboration now with uh, the veterinarian school in our university. And then with Professor Nawab, so because he has got two labs, one in Johns Hopkins University, US, and one in TU Munich. And now we do something which I would have never thought I would be doing, and this is to look into dogs. Because as it turns out, well, I, I think people are now starting in, uh, um, un, uh, with uh, humans, right? You have a surgery, and during the surgery, you can see um, uh, medical image data directly inside the thing you're operating on, or the human. And now it seems like in the uh, veterinarian world, this is a totally new thing. Uh, it seems like they are lagging a little behind, behind the um, surgery and treatment of humans. So I think this is a very, very um, high potential area to apply X-ray vision on. So it's quite interesting, right? So 2009, it started with this kind of simple um, prototypes. And now it's about really to use, bring that to the education of medical students and also to surgery theaters. So, so this was one big stream I did in the last 20 years, was to work on serious applications. And so if you think about all the X-ray things together with companies, uh, that was targeted for consumers. And also now the, the several medical applications, it's all very serious. And now I haven't shown work I did in automotive applications, industrial applications, military applications, um, but everything was serious. But now there's another um, thread of my research, which is, um, well, started a little later. So this was while I was in Japan. So in Japan, there is this subculture of otaku. So they're like technology uh, fascinated people and they like these kind of cartoons. And you wouldn't believe that. So this video is from 2012. It's very old, 2012. But now if you look at what's happening there, so they have an object detection. So for example, here it detects the motorbike, or here it detects the kitchen, or here it detects, so there's an object detection. There's a SLAM system running. And also there's a real-time depth, real depth map generation. As you can see, there are kind of correct occlusions between this um, character and the motorcycle. And this really got me thinking. So you have these kind of hobbyist people who develop these kind of powerful systems. I mean, I guess they could publish that at ISMAR or IEEE VR, but um, they just make it for fun. And why do they make it? So I believe they get a huge additional value um, if they can see this character in their environment. So they really love this character and now they can see it in their garage and in their kitchen and in their bathroom. Um, so they really, there is something. So I felt there is some high value in the, the area of entertainment and non-serious applications. And then while I was in Japan, we made a couple of these more entertainment applications. So the first one is interesting. So, um, so in Japan, they have very traditional ghosts, which is maybe uh, similar in Germany to the uh, Heinzelmännchen. So, so this is a kind of um, ghost which exists for like, I think 1,500 years ago. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of written record and also paintings. And the interesting point about these ghosts, which are called yokai, is that they are tied to real objects. So for example, here you can see this typical Japanese sliding door, and then there's this eye ghost, and the eye ghost appears in these sliding doors. Or there's an umbrella, and then you have the umbrella ghost. And so that's, I thought, and when I heard about that, and I said, hmm, but this sounds perfectly suited for AR, right? Because in AR, we want to uh, combine, um, place graphics uh, next to real objects and somehow associate the graphics with the real objects. 
Um, and then what we did is, um, so there's a web page for this project, aiyokai.com. So we went to this um, old temple in Kyoto. It's a Zen temple, actually. And in there, we developed a ghost story. So let me show you that one. So you can see there's like a multi-user application and now they're going to the entrance area of the temple where you're supposed to take off your shoes and then they see the shoe ghosts. Okay, this is a special ghost. He's not tied to any places, but he's kind of the leader of the ghosts. And I think this is a very unique movie. I mean, you have these here gold-plated um, thousand-year-old uh, cultural artifacts and then you have people running around in hololenses and seeing um, 3D graphics. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I let this play, it's just a short movie. And uh, yeah, if you want to find out more, then uh, please look, check this webpage so they can find more movies and uh, other things, more information. And then a little later, we did another project. So this was the PhD thesis of Damien. And uh, here we worked together also with an uh, industrial design lab and a couple of other people. And uh, what this was about, so this was like this kind of massive multiplayer game. So the idea was we want to have an AR game which can run in the city-wide scale and with hundreds of people at the same time. Uh, turned out, yeah, it's everything not so easy. Um, but let me show you some, I think there's some remarkable scenes in here. So here, for example, so, Our system. so you can see this is like in a subway station. Yeah, this is just uh, some random, well, it's, one, it's a busy um, subway station or right here, this is on the streets and it works at daytime, nighttime. So I think this is uh, quite remarkable that this kind of game was possible. I mean, it's like four years ago. So nowadays we can make much more powerful games. All right, so um, these are my, I think my conclusions of my retrospective that um, I started out more with this um, series applications and uh, recently I moved more into this uh, entertainment and fun applications. And, um, and I think now this is what I want to pursue in Hong Kong. So let me speak now, the second part of my talk, let me more speak about the future. So this was my title slide. And now on my title slide, you can see I'm in uh, several different roles. So maybe now I want to explain these one by one because they very much influence the future of my work. So first of all, you can see I'm at the School of Creative Media at the City University of Hong Kong. So let me show you a movie about that. The School of Creative Media at City University, Hong Kong is internationally recognized as a leading center of media art, innovation and education in Asia. Here at the school, we train students to become masters of the digital tools and technologies that define our age in order to create significant works of media art and design. Students at the school learn in a wide variety of disciplines including animation, gaming, computer art, digital media installation, film, and photography. Welcome to the school. So, I mean, if you, for example, now, I mean, I showed you earlier this um, AR yokai, so this um, ghost story made in Japan. I mean, now it's interesting, when I show this to people in the school, everybody tells me how bad it is. Because uh, from, I mean, if you're an animation expert or movie expert, then it's terrible. Right, so I think this is very interesting for me now to work more with experts in that, yeah? Experts in art and entertainment. So it's, I think, the ideal breeding ground for uh, this threat of my plan to uh, make more entertainment and art applications. And now inside this um, school now, so uh, we have a laboratory and this is called the Extended Reality Lab. Um, and this, I co-direct this with uh, Alvaro Cassinelli. And um, maybe let me quickly show you this web page. So if you go on our web page, you can find a lot of information. So for example, you can see our team, which has now expanded quite a bit. 
Um, you can find projects, so there are movies and information for the things we are doing. And yes, and contact if you want to visit us one day. So this is where we are. Yes, so you see here in Hong Kong, so very south of China. Okay, but um, so now um, I want to quickly introduce Alvaro to you. And uh, this is a, a very difficult task because Alvaro uh, knows a lot of things. I think he's kind of the modern day Leonardo da Vinci, that he's a very big artist. So he won the biggest uh, art prize in Japan twice, uh, but also he's a great researcher. So it's hard, but um, okay, I picked a few things of his work. So this in my view is um, the most impressive work because that time actually I was working in Japan and I went to a museum and then I saw that work and I was uh, totally blown away. Like, what is this? So, and what this is, you see, so this is a, like um, a screen and you can basically touch that screen and it's really a cloth. So it's a deformable cloth and that cloth is tracked at a kilohertz rate, the deformations. And then by the way, how you deform it, you can change what is showing. So you see, it's kind of, um, it's a night, it's a day scene of Tokyo. And now if you um, push it, then it shows you the night scene. So it means by the deformation in depth, you can um, browse different information. And here, I mean, this is technically very impressive. So in 2004, to achieve kilohertz tracking of surfaces, I think it's uh, unheard of. And here's another example. So this is now a rotten watermelon, which was recorded in time-lapse. And if you push strongly into it, yeah, then you can see the original state. But if you let go and it um, deforms back, then it shows you the rotten state. Um, so in general, I think the Alvaro's work has the one threat I could identify is this high-speed optoelectronics. So he worked 15 years in this laboratory at the University of Tokyo. And now these are some newer systems that they have done. So this was Al after Alvaro left. But um, so it shows you this kind of spirit. So it's also, again, this is kilohertz tracking of the surface of the t-shirt and projecting on it. And I mean, I've tried this system and it feels like it's printed on the shirt. So there's no way you can fool the tracking. It's really bulletproof and at kilohertz rate. And then, so the first article that, the first paper that Alvaro and me wrote together was in 2015. And um, so it's an archive article and it's called Breaking the Barriers to True Augmented Reality. And what this article is speaking about, it's, um, it's basically defining a Turing test for augmented reality. Because I guess most of you are familiar with the original Turing test that um, Alan Turing described in 1950. And this was about, so how can we measure the um, quality of an artificial intelligence? And then there's this kind of imitation game. And so, and similarly, we want to do, have something for AR that we can say, okay, now, if you can really track the pupils precisely and spawn a light field on the right spot uh, on, on the eyeball, then well, it sh people should not be able to detect anymore what is real and what is virtual. Um, and out of that thing, so now very recently, so together with Alvaro and Jason Habich, um, postdoc in our lab, um, we got a work accepted into SIGGRAPH Asia, which is this kind of very high speed um, laser projection. So you can see here, there's, it's just a demo. So there's like a blob and whenever you touch it, it moves. But the interesting part about this is um, how it's implemented. So here you can see the end-to-end -end latency. So end-to-end -end latency is two milliseconds. So this now, um, yeah, you touch it and okay, then the, some animation happens. And now if you record this with a high speed camera, you can see it's uh, 2.4 milliseconds. And also this ties back to the like 2009 work Alvaro has done previously. And now in our lab, you see we have now so many people and so many things are going on. So I cannot um, show everything to you. So I just wanna quickly explain some highlights. So besides Alvaro and me, we have two mentors, Jeffrey Shaw and Maurice Benayoun. And uh, yeah, wow, uh, these are very impressive people. So um, Jeffrey Shaw, built his first AR system in 1975, which was the year I was born. So this is a quite an impressive mentor. It's very interesting for me to talk with him about AR. And Maurice, so he built the first PC-based cave in France near Laval. 
And yeah, well, so he's an artist, but yeah, like if it's necessary for art, so see, it's like high tech art. So I think this is the spirit of our school. And then we have residents, which are like um, visitors who spend like two months a year with us. And I want to show you one, which is uh, Elliot Woods. My name is Elliot Woods, and I'm one half of Kimchi and Chips Art Collective based in South Korea. Today, I'm going to introduce a project I've been researching with the City University of Hong Kong, XRL Lab. This is a lab where researchers look into techniques for bringing the digital world into physical reality. At Kimchi and Chips, we exploit and critique technologies which mediate between the material and the immaterial. Our artworks often involve controlling physical fields of light and often at large scale. This can be achieved using calibrated video projectors and curved mirrors to create a field of light in space. We call this a light field projector. Alternatively, we can use an array of steerable mirrors which use existing light from the environment and redirect this light in a controlled fashion. We call this a light field manipulator. By manipulating fields of light, we can create controllable illumination within an environment. So I should shortly interrupt here. Um, so this was the previous work that um, Elliot has done. And he's done a lot with a uh, lot of different light field displays. And now in the collaboration with us, the question, the kind of idea is, what about if we can make this small and even like really small? So we have this kind of uh, mirror array and we can control it very precisely. Then we could do things like that, that we can re-channel the sunlight. Um, as a illumination video. within an environment. We can create infrared heat couplings between objects and we can create new interesting image formats. Into the future, we predict that light field manipulator systems will scale downwards in element size, upwards in frequency and downwards in cost. This becomes particularly interesting when we approach the scale of a photon of light. Current commercial semiconductor processes regularly fabricate transistors, which are 100 times smaller than the wavelength of visible light. Considering that a conductor and a mirror are electromagnetically the same thing, we can imagine that sub-photon scale addressable digital... All right, so, um, so now I explained to you uh, bottom up. So I explained about the School of Creative Media, about the Extended Reality Lab. Now, the last thing I want to explain in my talk is about this. So the Guangzhou Greater Bay Area Virtual Reality Research Institute, or for uh, short, Bay VR, uh, where I recently became the Augmented Reality Evangelist. So let me explain about that. This is also part of the future. I believe that the future of AR and VR lies in China. And one of the reasons for that is, is well, nowadays, everything is deep learning. I mean, I haven't, so in this video, my so I haven't showed you the details, but um, now for the steering algorithms, of course, we use deep learning. All loop. And, uh, oh, sorry. Just a moment. Uh, and I mean, if you look at the facts, then well, the China is totally dominating deep learning because they have all the data, right? So where maybe in other countries, there would be concerns about privacy. This doesn't really exist in China. So, well, they have most of the data, so they have the best data, so their deep learning is the best. But okay, so let me explain about this here. So first of all, I want to explain about the Pearl River Delta, which you may or may not have heard about yet. Um, let me show you this. So there's a very cool uh, web page, which uh, I link to here in my presentation. And um, so this is the Pearl River Delta. And um, basically they explain here on this webpage that this is the, um, one of the biggest megalopolis on earth. And you see, so here on the bottom, this is Hong Kong. And then he, over here, is the small part is Macau. And then uh, directly above Hong Kong is Shenzhen, which is called the Silicon Valley of hardware. Um, and then above um, is Guangzhou. And inside Guangzhou, um, that's where this um, Bay VR Institute is located. And uh, in Guangzhou, the uh, prefecture and the capital is Guangdong, which is the third biggest city in China. So probably you know Beijing and Shanghai, which are the top two. And then number three is um, Guangdong, so the capital of Guangzhou. Um, 
so so there is this uh, extreme hub of technology and factories and hardware manufacturing and it's also a very rich area and uh, so now um, maybe zoom out. So this, this is China. And now you can see here at the very bottom, you can see there's Macau, Hong Kong, uh, Guang, Guangzhou. So this is uh, what I just showed you, but China is very, very big. And now in China, there's an enormous amount of investments into AR and VR. So, I mean, I'm also now uh, learning about this, um, but this is like an excerpt of um, government um, projects currently in China. And you can see there are things like, yeah, building a $100 billion VR industry and uh, you see everywhere, yeah? So all over China, there's got a huge government funding into AR and VR. So, and now my assistant who uh, thankfully made this slide for me. So um, he found two with concrete numbers. So you can see there's one in Beijing, which is 1.2 billion euro. And there's an, one in Weifang, which is 600 million euros. So if you look at the scale of these investments, it's a dozens and dozens of billions. So it's my recommendation for the German industry, if you're looking for a market for VR, you need to look at China. Um, and then next, um, so there are all these initiatives, but now um, what these initiatives also include is, so they built, and I don't know, this is the, I think in, in German, you would call this competence centrum. So there are now a couple of these competence centers, which the Bay VR is one of them. And um, now what are these competence centers doing? So let me speak a little about that. So in the Bay VR, where I'm the evangelist, um, so this is the scientific leadership, is the School of Optics and Photonics of the Beijing Institute of Technology. And there are three professors, so Professor Liu, Professor Wang, and another Professor Wang. And this, this professor, Yong Tiang Wang, uh, I can tell you this is the optics champ of China. So Magic Leap is paying him royalties because Magic Leap is actually using um, some of his optics patterns. And um, yes, and then, so they have this um, internal leadership here inside China, and now they have the external expert, experts. So there's Professor Wu from Macau, who's I think quite famous for physics-based simulation and many SIGGRAPH papers. Um, there's me, the outlier, yes, and they have also other experts. And um, now I can show you some things. So, so this is now not from BayVR, but it's from a sister institute in Nanchang, which I visited recently. And you see they're doing things here like um, head mount display benchmarking. So you can see here, like you have, uh, they have rotary stages, linear stages for um, the controlled movement or the KUKA robots. Uh, for the controlled movements of displays, and then you can do very precise latency measurements. Another thing is, um, yeah, there's like Paul Debevec's slide stage. So basically some environment that allows you to capture photorealistic avatars of humans. And once you have these photorealistic avatars, then yeah, you can use them for all kinds of things. So for example, to have virtual humans and to animate them. And also a big thing is um, to um, build AR, VR, um, systems and content for theme parks. Because um, in China, there are many industries which are like building up like crazy. I mean, even cinemas. So they still, I don't know, have about only half uh, of the amount of cinemas they need. So they're building cinemas like crazy. And also they're building theme parks like crazy. But well, but then you need things to run in the theme parks. So this is one other major stream of research. And so last but not least, so um, if you're interested to know more, so you can go on the webpage of BayVR, which is uh, gbamr.com. And there you can yeah, read more, but also you can download demos. So all of these six here, these are downloadable uh, VR demos that you can run on your headset. Okay, so um, that's my conclusion for today. So I spoke a lot about my past and uh, also about where I see the future going. So, um, so that's it. So I'm looking forward to your questions. Vielen Dank, Christian. Es war äh, Wahnsinn. Äh, von äh, Geister im, im Kyoto-Tempel bis zu äh, äh, große Projekte in China. Ähm, so, es macht äh, die Augen offen, ja. Ähm, gibt es Fragen von der Audienz? Noch nicht? Doch. 
Can you comment okay. on the current political situation in Hong Kong? <laughs> um, I would love to, but because of the current uh, legal situation, I can't do that without talking to a lawyer first. So apologies, no political things today. But um, okay, maybe I can say some more uh, general things. So um, yeah, because I mean, often I get contacted like, uh, are you still alive um, kind of thing? Um, but I think it's not that bad. So oh, yeah, but uh, um, sorry, sorry. It's uh, difficult with the current laws to speak about politics. Ich bin auf in China und ich weiß, dass es äh, ähm, sehr schwierig ist, über Politik zu sprechen. Ja, yeah, ähm, I, I, I think the, the problem is at the moment that it's um, not really clear what is legal, what is illegal. So um, that, that makes it complicated. Right? So if now I make some statement about China, it's not clear if I could get in trouble for that or not, or where exactly is the border. So I'd rather refrain at the moment from making statements. Do you have some questions about AR or VR? <lacht> Vielleicht eine Frage. Du hast, oh, da ist eine, eine Frage. Why did you start with the burning hand experiment? And this is actually a funny question because the person asking this question is my current PhD student, Daniel, who is now making the 2020 version of the burning hand system. <laughs> so I guess it's an ironic question. Uh, but okay, so originally, why did we start? So our goal was to make a demo with extreme realism. And then we noticed that a big problem is that for objects to get the lighting right. So, I mean, strictly speaking, you need a real time measurement of the environment light, and then you can light objects correctly. And in 2011, this was not really possible. So then we thought about, hmm, okay, what about making fire? Because fire um, is an illuminant itself. So it doesn't, we don't need to know the environment light in order to render correct fire. So this is how we started. Uh, maybe I can say a few things about Daniel's current work, because now he has made a better fire version. And with that better fire now, we are trying to make much more scientific measurements. So we are now working with the psychology department and also the chemistry department in our university. And then it's about measuring um, things like cytokines, which are neurotransmitters that your body will emit if you really would be burned. Uh, so this is one thing, or also we're looking into um, working with a burn injury re rehabilitation center about uh, using low laser Doppler imaging, because then we can see the blood flow. Because if you really get burned, then I assume that the body will retract the blood from the burned areas. So yeah, so basically Daniel is now doing the hard science for that. And we hope that this can become a nature paper one day or like something similar fundamental. Uh, will Apple be successful in the AR area? I'm I'm hundred percent sure, and the story I can why I'm so sure is that uh, Mitayo at some uh, so Apple at some point bought Mitayo, which is a Munich um, AR company, and the two founders of uh, Mitayo they learned augmented reality in Professor Klinker's AR lecture, and Professor Klinker was my PhD advisor. Uh, so also during my PhD, I met the Metayo students. At that time, they were still uh, little students. Um, yeah, so they learned from the best. So I think AR has a, uh, Apple has very good AR technology acquired from Metayo. So I think they will be very successful. Um, how much an issue are current AR displays FOF limitations? It's interesting. I mean. I remember in 2003, there was the ISMAR in Tokyo, and it was about uh, what is holding AR back. And answer was the field of view of head-mounted displays, which is still the same problem today. Um, it's very interesting. Um, so uh, David Gilbert's question. So um, Daniel Wagner has published an article maybe two years ago, which was called, why is it difficult to make AR head-mounted displays? And in that article, he's describing that um, if you think in terms of the optics of a, a head-mounted display, 
there are about 20 different quality factors that depend each other that depend on each other for example there's the exit pupil so the exit pupil means how much can your eye move without um, destroying the image and it turns out that the exit pupil is inversely proportional to the field of view this means i can make you a 360 degree ar head mount display today but then the exit pupil would be 0 0.1 millimeters that means you can't move your eye anymore so i think it's dangerous only to look at fof i think um and that's also upsetting for me when i want to buy an ar or vr head mounted display they only tell you a few parameters they don't tell you all the parameters which pupil uh, exit pupil size is one of the most important ones and nobody tells you those so yeah i, th I think fof is an important quality factor but i think um there are other very important ones. So I think you need to look at all of those 20. If you have a chance, and um, please look at the um, Daniel Wagner article about why is it difficult to make AR head mounts. Next one, Torsten Kuhlen. Hi, Torsten. Dear Christian, you introduced an AR application from four years ago. I mentioned it today. We have much more powerful applications and technology. Can you tell us what you think have been the most recent breakthroughs for AR? Is it mostly about much more powerful GPUs? Yeah, I think, I think there, there are many breakthroughs going on simultaneously. I mean, I think one very big one for me is deep learning. Yeah, I mean, I'm the computer scientist and I'm monitoring all the things. And I think yeah, um, maybe, I don't know, 2012 or 13, I would laugh about artificial intelligence and neural networks because everything was so childish and uh, couldn't do much. But now, um, I mean, now you have GPT-3, which I'm now using to complete the forms at my university, yeah, because it's so good. Or you have things like um, Style Gun, which can make photorealistic things, and you have deep fake, and you have all these um, amazing technologies. So I think deep learning is, was a huge enabler. If you see the, what the HoloLens 2 can do, the quality of the hand tracking and the environment reconstruction, uh, I mean, this, this is all deep learning. And um, this is also a lot of, about uh, a hardware manufacturing that you can uh, actually put algorithms into hardware. So there are many things in the HoloLens which are yeah, not running really in software, but which are implemented as ASICs. So um, I think that uh, is also something that the manufacturing capabilities get better. And I think the, also the material science. So if you now look, um, uh, many uh, AR head mounted displays are now based on waveguides. Uh, which to manufacture this with uh, enough precision and reasonable pricing, I think also it's just possible for a few years. Um, yeah, so I think deep learning, computation power, hardware manufacturing. Um, and I mean, now I'm, I'm, I'm trying to talk to material scientists because I see that this is one of the bottlenecks is that the materials aren't good enough. Jerome's question. You showed us the budgets and the efforts dedicated to AI in the US and China. What opportunities are there for Germany or even Europe in the field of AR? Um, you're welcome, Thorsten. Are we bound to be considered of the... So it's interesting. I mean, I remember um, maybe five years ago, I heard a keynote of Mel Slater. And the Mel Slater was saying that it's impossible to get the funding from the European Union for VR because they are like, okay, we invested there 10 years ago and it didn't work and now we don't invest into that anymore, which I think is a huge mistake, right? So, um, oh well, so there's something, but I think relatively speaking, Germany is very strong. I mean, there, I remember when I did the PhD, there was this whole RV car consortium and that which then became Avilus. And uh, so there's a lot of car industry in Germany doing very advanced things. So I think within Europe, Germany is very strongly positioned. And um, if I can give you a recommendation, yeah, uh, do something in China and uh, I'm glad to help. Gibt es noch ein, eine letzte Frage vielleicht? Für, ja, noch zwei Minuten. Holger Schulz. Do you have any explanation of daylight and NVG with HMD or AR goggles? Ah, I see, I see. Um, mm, so, well, I, 
let, let's say I, I have seen systems which, which combine this. So like this kind of multi-spectral sensing with uh, head-mounted displays. But it was more like um, I visited some institutions and could see some demonstrations, but I've never done that myself. Um, but I think it's very interesting. So I think this idea to um, give humans superhuman vision. And I mean, now, of course, the US military is doing it, but they're doing it for other reasons than I would like to. Uh, but if you imagine you have a doctor which can now sense things in real time, they can sense the blood flow or can sense things like that uh, on a human person. I think that would be an amazing application. So I think, yeah, definitely multispectral sensing and uh, display or merging this kind of information with a human vision uh, would be groundbreaking. It is important for HEMS simulation. Sorry, I don't know what HEMS uh, stands for. Ah, helicopter medical service. I mean, also I know that um, I saw the keynote by um, Tom Furness and he was showing work they did during the Vietnam War. And it was very interesting. So during the Vietnam War, the um, pilots had the night vision and X-ray vision combined. So they could do things like look through the plane. Um, so that's very interesting. So if you have a chance to check out uh, Tom Furness work, so Super Cockpits was the name of this project. And I think, yeah, of course this was all classified, but I think this may have expired now. So you can probably find information about that. So they did uh, night vision, yeah, as far back as 1975. So head mounted night vision combined with tracking, um, yeah, with head tracking. 